Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good day, good afternoon. Uh, Sam, uh, we welcome you today on our second ML Toolkit uh, webinar. Uh, here are some links uh, about uh, where you can download the projects which we would be talking about. Uh, and after the webinar, we, we will send you a presentation and uh, it would be also a recording of the webinar will be available on YouTube. So our, our guest speakers uh, today, I think we have the most uh, uh, geographically diverse uh, webinar for InterSystems community because uh, our guest speakers are Anton Umnikov, Senior Cloud Solution Architect, InterSystems, with us from Orlando, United States. Uh, Sergei Lukianchenkov, Sales Engineer from InterSystems, uh, with us from Paris, France, and me, Edward Lebduk, also Sales Engineer, InterSystems uh, from Moscow, Russia. And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, ML Toolkit, IML, and automating and robotizing uh, AI ML uh, workloads and projects. Oh, one other note before, before we start with the plan. Um, in your um, Zoom software, you have an option to ask questions. Uh, by clicking chat and we'll, yeah, some people already found this function. Uh, and if you have any question, please uh, write them there in, in chat to organizers or to everyone and uh, we will answer them at the end. Okay, so back to our agenda. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll tell you some news about uh, ML Toolkit, what we are getting to. Uh, and uh, show free demos uh, about uh, robotizing the use of uh, IML models. Uh, we we'll try to get it all done in under an hour, and after that we would we will have a Q and A. So ask your questions. Okay, so some some projects. Um, we are all around the world. Uh, with a uh, bank from Kazakhstan, they were on Global Summit actually, and we were presenting a session together. Um, they are interested in uh, forecasting uh, next best um, payments, uh, clustering their customers and so on, and they are doing with uh, InterSystems uh, Machine Learning Toolkit. We already uh, finished a discovery phase and are progressing with a piloting of a recommendation system. In the United States of America, a group of radiology centers, they were also with us uh, on this global summit. Uh, we also done a session together. Uh, and uh, they're doing uh, matching for diff between different uh, terminologies, which is a very a um, very challenging uh, topic in, uh, in between many different medical uh, terminologies available today. Supermarket uh, network from Hungary, uh, also using uh, InterSystems ML Toolkit uh, to simplify data transfer and uh, they have a series of uh, Python scripts and reports and they are building a supermarket uh, rating system. One of our application partners uh, from Ukraine are developing their own uh, master data management solution. It's already available as an offering. And uh, one of the important parts of uh, master data management is built in golden record. Uh, and they use ML toolkits to do record linkage to find uh, links between different records to unify them into a golden record. Uh, last but not least, a, a big utility company from Russia is um, in the process of uh, discovery. Um, 
they are interested in clustering for their customers, uh, clients, and uh, we are currently in discussion of uh, depth uh, modeling proof of concept. These are some interesting projects which we are currently doing uh, on InterSystems ML Toolkit. Some of them are in production, some of them are moving uh, towards uh, production usage, and some are just starting. So, well, here is, uh, here is a small update. All right. Uh, before we move to the most uh, interesting part, I think the demos, uh, I'd like to talk a little about InterSystem service and uh, AI machine learning and how can we help you to, uh, to complete successfully your AI ML projects. First of all, InterSystem service is a, a data platform, so there could be and um, usually are a lot of uh, business data if you're using InterSystem service to connect different systems. It's a great place to start exploring the data you have available because the IML projects uh, usually require a very wide array of uh, data in, in large volumes. Uh, InterSystem service uh, makes it possible to robotize the use of the IML. This is the main topic of our today's webinar. How can we uh, build a model? But after we built it, it's not the end in itself. Build a uh, working model is only a part of the process, and uh, robotizing it uh, and integrating it into a transactional business process is uh, maybe even more important because we need uh, we we really need to get value from that model, and it is only possible if first of all we are always sure that it produces actionable results, and second of all we need. Uh, this results right now while we are doing our transactions, uh, while we are doing our business processes. And InterSystem Cyrus makes it possible to do exactly that. Uh, to do all that, we uh, can build and execute models with uh, Python and R programming languages, which are probably one of the most popular languages for developing uh, machine learning artificial intelligence models. And with that intro, I'd like to uh, move to the first demo and to pass the microphone and the screen to my colleague, Anton. Anton, are you? Yes, are you I'm with? there. Thank okay. you very much, Edward. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, talking to you about uh, AWS SageMaker and you'll get uh, in a second why I'm talking about that. If you uh, never heard about AWS SageMaker, it's Amazon Cloud Managed Machine Learning Platform and Service. So it's fully managed, so you don't have to configure your instances. The instances are uh, GPU enabled, so uh, some advanced learning such as deep learning, CNN, RNN, can be very effectively trained there. Uh, you have managed Jupyter Notebook, uh, you have cluster of instances that you can spin up on demand, wide variety of algorithms as you can see there, and you can bring your own algorithms into SageMakers, into SageMaker. Uh, if you're working in a regulated industry such as healthcare, it's all HIPAA eligible and a bunch of other certifications across the industries. Uh, what's probably the most important uh, thing that you need to know about SageMaker is that in SageMaker you pay for actual training time only. You don't pay for these really expensive GPU powered instances while you staring at your code and trying to figure out where in your Python code you made a typo or a mistake. Right? The instances has been provisioned on demand and they run in for as long as your model need to be trained, as soon as training is done, uh, instances shut down and you're not incurring any additional costs, right? So compare that to provisioning the instance with uh, having GPU, so having in-house machine learning workstation with bunch of GPUs, it's way less expensive, way less economical to use SageMaker for training your models 
and then executing them either in the cloud or uh, on premises. Okay. So uh, let me show you uh, how it works from AWS perspective, right? So in AWS Management Console here, uh, we have a whole bunch of services that AWS Cloud provides, right? Uh, some compute services, storage services, and so on. You can even, you even have services that let you to communicate with satellites, right? And what's interesting, the approach I'll be showing you in a minute would work with all of the services because we will use standard AWS APIs, but the service we're interested in today is AWS SageMaker. So in SageMaker, you can have your notebooks, which is your managed uh, Jupyter notebooks. You can have your training uh, jobs. You can have your uh, inference, which is actually running the model in the cloud. And as you can see from this dashboard, nothing is active right now, right? So let me switch to my Iris terminal. As you can see, it's a standard Iris instance. And in here, I do have already preloaded configuration, right? So the configuration uh, in this particular case is a SQL statement that tells us what data do I need to pull in from Iris to train my model, right? So basically arbitrary data that you already have in your Iris instance uh, can be used for training purposes. Then I specify the type of the instance. Uh, that I'll be using to train my model. In this case, it's a CPU intensive uh, extra large instance, like, uh, because it, it makes sense for that particular task. If we're doing something like deep learning with uh, frameworks like TensorFlow, uh, we'll be using GPU enabled instances, right? But the approach would be essentially the same. Here is I'm supplying what code I want to execute on that instance and some hyperparameters, right? Usually people who are familiar with machine learning at this point start to laugh because uh, in more serious real life scenario, these hyperparameters can span few pages, right? In this case, we're just doing that just to show that you can pass hyperparameters to the instance. So now let me start this job. Right, so I'm passing this configuration uh, JSON file to my AWS SageMaker. And yeah, job has started. So a whole bunch of things started to happen, in, but they're not happening on my instance. they all happening at, uh, eight on AWS site. So if I'll refresh this page right now, right, I would see that one job is running and this job is initiated from within my Iris instance, right? So I'm running uh, AWS job from within Iris, right? This job would run for three to four minutes depending on the uh, complexity of the job, right? We can look at few jobs that we already completed uh, prior to today, right? We, let's pick this one, for example, right? So it's the same job, uh, training time is just 32 seconds. So it takes time to spin up the instances to uh, push the data from my local Iris instance to the cloud. Overall time would be three to four minutes, as I said, but the time you'll be billed for, so time you will be paying for is 32 seconds. Actually, Amazon would say, yeah, we have per second billing, but per second billing starts with uh, one minute exactly, so I would be billed for 60 seconds, right? So a few cents here I would actually lose, but well, come on, I'm not paying for this expensive instance for hours and hours while I'm debugging my code while I'm trying to uh, optimize what I'm doing. I'm paying exactly for the time instances being trained and uh, the uh, billing component for that particular job would be a couple of cents at most. Right, and again, there's a big instance type and a whole bunch of other uh, information. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, I would, uh, would not keep you waiting for a few minutes to the job to complete it, but uh, a log file would look something like this, right? We started the job, then we have a whole bunch of debug information, and finally job would be completed. 
and will incur billing for 36 seconds. Like what would happen after that, right? We will pull this model from uh, AWS locally and would uh, be able to execute it locally in Iris and uh, this kind of scenario. This is what uh, Edward and Sergey would show you uh, down the road, right? So how it works, right? You have Iris instance that can be located in the on-prem or uh, in AWS cloud and through standard APIs, we would be interacting with your uh, S3 bucket, AWS SageMaker, and if we choose so, we would run this model in AWS. Alternatively, we can uh, choose to run this model in uh, on-prem, so this endpoint uh, green box would not exist, right? If we run this model in AWS, the only ongoing cost we would incur is running the model in AWS, so next time we need to make a prediction, we'll make a to cloud service, right? Or we can um, go into model like this where all we're doing at AWS is training the model and then model is being executed locally, right? In this case, there are no ongoing costs. So everything is shut down, everything is gray, uh, model is being executed locally. Now, the way it works is we're using standard APIs using Python Gateway uh, standard AWS APIs to call uh, SageMaker to interact with uh, cloud storage, which is S3 bucket, and to move data to and from the bucket, uh, between bucket and our local instance. Uh, what's important in this approach, right? And why the Python is uh, so key uh, to this kind of interaction. In theory, that all can be done through set of REST APIs that would let me from Iris to call SageMaker to interact with S3 buckets, uh, bypassing Python altogether. But it would be a significant development effort for me or for, for anyone else, because unlike Python, the REST API, even though it's documented, there are no really readily available samples or uh, libraries that shows you how exactly you need to do that. So I'll just give you the few numbers, right? It took me around three hours to set up the local environment that would let me call SageMaker uh, through Python from my local machine, right? The whole bunch of libraries need to be loaded, security and roles initiated. And after that, it took me just 15 minutes to translate the code from existing uh, Python uh, Jupyter Notebook into the code I use uh, from Iris. If I am to translate this uh, notebook into the REST calls, it would probably take me a couple of weeks. So the big enabler here, uh, Python Gateway, not only it let you call arbitrary Python code from within Iris, it opens up the whole uh, community, the whole environment, all the source code, all the libraries that do exist in Python and that might be hard to find in any other language. So on this note, I would pass the word to my colleagues and Edward, your turn. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you, Anton. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen in just a second. Do you see my screen? Okay. Yes, let's go to a, to a second demo. It's about um, real-time predictive maintenance. Uh, and uh, this is a scenario from IoT industry, so let's say we have an engine. To be exact, it's a turbine. And uh, any industrial big engine usually has a lot of sensors, which is always ready to supply you data in however uh, great amount you want it. The trouble is processing. Our 
sample and simplified example uh, turbine has only 45 sensors and in our data set we already know a turbine state to simplify matters there are only two states available turbine either works uh, and everything is fine or the turbine doesn't work and we need to do something so our goal from a from a more business um, point perspective is to predict um, engine uh, failure beforehand and to run predictive maintenance because as soon as we uh, predicted uh, that something would happen engine would stop working and uh, we can actually do something with that, right? We can write an e generate an email, we can create a human workflow task, well, do something. We can do uh, predict maintenance, that's, that's the point, right? So here is how it's done in, in, in this example. We have InterSystem Cyrus data platform, um, and inside that we have several components. We have uh, Python operation, which is used to hold or our Python code. And uh, first of all, we have train process. Train process simply has all the parts. Let me show you how it looks for a second. Uh, yes. All right. So uh, you can check the Python code inside the process, what's uh, what composite, and it's used to train a model. We also have check survive. Uh, check survive train uh, checks uh, existing model predictions and validates them against uh, true data. Eventually, in in real life, uh, we don't know the engine state at the moment because if we did, um, we either find or already have a problem. We want to know it for a future, for a nearest future, or we have a trouble getting it immediately. And so that's why we want to predict that. Um, in check service, uh, we correlate our predictions with uh, the data, the true data, true engine state we will get eventually. And uh, based on that information, we can calculate the error level of our model. Does the model work or um, does the, if the model doesn't work, right? On the other hand, uh, we have predict process which we, are uh, which we use to call the model. and uh, get, uh, get uh, predictions back. And we have predict service, which um, gets the data from outside, from our en engine, and uh, calls predict process to get predictions back. Now, so far it's all um, fairly straightforward, hopefully. Let's see how it all works. Uh, check service um, detects when anomaly happens, when something changed, and or change the model and with InterSystems uh, analytics. Yes, uh, we can see how it all works together. As you can see, our model starts uh, just fine, but after a while, the error level uh, percentage goes up after a certain threshold. We can see it in a check uh, service here. We have our threshold, uh, so it's all easily configurable. And as soon as the model exceeds this, uh, this threshold, the model is retrained. Right, so after we retrain the model, the error per stage goes down for a while. And uh, after some time, because uh, it's uh, compressed, um, the data set we have is compressed across several months, so the engine uh, wears out. And to get back to our presentation, uh, this uh, setup allows for AI ML robotization. Uh, we built the model and it was done mostly manually with new QuickML, which will be soon available. 
you can uh, automate that part too. But for now, we build the model by hands. And uh, what's uh, important, what's the point is uh, that we are doing model validation and model retraining. And in some cases, in you know, modern model hyperparameter training, um, training automatically. So uh, humans don't need to do to perform this task anymore. They're all automated, and, and it, there's a process which automatically controls the accuracy of modeling results and adjusts the model accordingly. Uh, and uh, with InterSystems Iris, you can easily implement uh, solutions of um, this scale. If you're interested in this demo. At the end of the presentation, I will tell you how to reproduce it. Uh, there are several very simple ways. But now, with that said, uh, I'd like to pass uh, the screen to my colleague, Sergey. Thank you, Edward. And I'll pick it up from here uh, to basically to continue your story, Edward. Hopefully my screen is seen now. Uh, by I see your screen, yes. Uh, perfect. Uh, by asking several several questions. So for example, what would happen if we, because what we've seen in the previous, in, in Edward's demo, the previous demo, we've seen that we can automate <coughs> and um, actually orchestrate using the Iris platform capabilities the uh, running of uh, ML content, uh, what would it be if um, the external environment becomes uh, really stochastic, really unpredictable? So for example, we may have uh, enough training data for the moment, the next moment, uh, something drastically changes in the nature of the data and we need to retrain, uh, not because the error uh, goes uh, beyond the limits we expected to go, but just uh, the pressing requirement of the external environment that we train on something that represents this environment fairly. What happens if we all of a sudden got more training data in one training round that we expected, and then uh, we are we don't have time to <laughs> to actually to get back in time to continue our prediction work. What happens? What happens? And, and there are many, many uh, other other possible situations that may arise in the real world, especially if our email is embedded in uh, uh, highly dynamic uh, processes, real life processes that may need a, uh, I'll say, more elaborated approach uh, to uh, its robotization. And that's where we start speaking about actually speaking the previously monolithical analytical process, however nice and finished it may look, into a system of processes. So what we see in this slide, we see basically in the left part, which we're, we're seeing the, the same uh, model that Edward implemented. But this time our ask is to basically to, to make our, our platform, our AI platform to recognize which portion of it is responsible for training which portion of this is responsible for uh, scoring, for prediction. Maybe there could be other portions to do the evaluation of a freshly trained uh, model and so on. So all of a sudden our previously monolithical process becomes a set of processes. And in the demo that we're going to show you uh, now, uh, we are um, actually presenting an example of such a system. We we have a process that generates input data at regular intervals in uh, as files of uh, regular length. We have a process called buffer that actually reads the input files and organizes queues to uh, make sure we cope with data insufficiency and we, we, we can uh, actually maintain uh, the most uh, actual representation in that buffer of the training reality and of the predict the, the reality that we're trying to predict. We have a process called analyzer that actually embeds all the Python content. Uh, we're using Python in this case, uh, even, even if in that slide uh, we've taken it from another example. We have, uh, and, and Edward was mentioning it in the beginning, we, we can use both uh, Python and R in, in, in the same system and the same process. 
and we have a monitor uh, process that is uh, responsible for uh, monitoring the accuracy of uh, the modeling done by analyzer and uh, actually the, this process also manages the the resulting queue that means it takes into results the the, the records that receive the prediction and it deletes the old predictions and maintains a buffer, so to speak, of the most actual prediction. So, um, what kind of what kind of uh, ML content we are going to to demo, and what what are, go, are we going to envelope in this uh, robotizer sort of template? We decided to make it sentiment analysis, so the classical machine learning task when you need to by uh, actually training training your model on uh, examples of uh, positive and negative statements you need to, to 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 learn how to classify the statements the in this case the, the, we, we we are working with tweets statements uh, posts from twitter social network you need to learn how to classify uh, the tweets that you don't know you you, you don't know uh, you don't see their labeling let's take it Look at this through the model size, and then <clears throat> what we further add to to this uh, example to to make it um, actually resemble as much as possible a real life situation. When, for example, the sentiment analysis is not a one off action, but it has to be a continual action. For example, you are sort of an analytical agency, and you're you're monitoring the internet, a number of sources, and you do the sentiment analysis on something that is a uh, and you're also training your models on something that represents the actuality of your current moment, but uh, soon it uh, may be necessary to, to uh, refresh your uh, training data. And um, in parallel, you also have to look at how actually, how accurate your classification is. In, in, in this setup, what we uh, need to achieve, we need to uh, not only do it once, but we need to start working with some minimum available information and do the first training and then start predicting using that minimum um, training data set. Observing the results we are receiving, then if uh, the results we are receiving are not within uh, the threshold of the accuracy we want, then we start growing our training data set. We redo the training, start applying it. We see that we are able to achieve, we are able to obtain more predictions. So we work longer without uh, dropping out of error, error, uh, error thresholds. And then we repetitively Actually, we construct a system that as long as it feels that the training data set is not enough, it refeeds it with fresh information from the external sources. And uh, by that, it copes with the, with the dynamics of the outer expression, outer uh, environment. And uh, basically, by this, it also self-monitors and self-regulates its uh, accuracy. So with that... Uh, Right. With that, let's go to my system here. I've, I'm, I'm starting by showing you, maybe in, in a static way first, the, the outcomes of the previous uh, run of this example. So uh, at least um, there will be three dashboards that allow us to, to be in a complete cockpit of what's going on here. So basically, we have a buffer control dashboard that allows us to see what batches of uh, data to classify the unclassified tweets we are receiving. So those numbers at the bottom are the batches. The batches, uh, one batch is 100 tweets. Uh, we we see the average time it takes for the for the solution to insert this batch into 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 the buffer, just for performance control in case we're starting to get problems with performance we'll be seeing it here and we have a sort of preview of what we currently have in the unclassified tweets buffer and classified tweets buffer is not the only one we have also buffers for positively labeled and negatively labeled tweets we just don't put them on the dashboard but let's keep in mind they, they also exist we will have a uh, analyzer dashboard to basically control the two crucial two crucial moving parts in this example. We'll, we will be controlling the evolution of um, our neural networks. We'll be using uh, the uh, recurring neural net in this example. And by the way, this example has been 
borrowed, we, did, we didn't build it ourselves, we just have been looking at the available things on the internet and took one public, publicly available example that uh, has seemed to us relatively compact on the one hand, performant and also interesting. So through that example, we, we have a capacity to actually to, to train a neural net and we'll be controlling this neural net's progress as it's being trained and we'll be controlling it by running a validation of the model uh, implemented in the neural net. That means we'll be, in, in the end of each training, we'll be applying that neural net to its own training data set and uh, measuring the accuracy. On the other hand, in parallel, the, the trained uh, model is applied to the unclassified data from the buffer. And uh, as we all see it, the, the, the accuracy received, even if, if our trained model on the training, on the evaluation of the tra trained model, it's done relatively good. So relatively good in this example is um, above 80% of um, the so-called area under curve. This is a well-known indicator to measure classification accuracy. And we'll uh, take a look at the concrete examples of and concrete, and concrete, actually concrete curve classification curve, rock curves produced by Python as it works through that process. So we will see that uh, the uh, area under curve, the classification accuracy achieved during prediction, it could be lower, it could be higher, but sometimes it's mostly lower than something that we see at the, at the outcome of the training process. So this is an important controlling mechanism here that automatically detects when the uh, accuracy at prediction becomes below a certain threshold. And once the monitor uh, process, uh, the one that we've shown before, it detects that it dropped below that level. It may not detect, by the way, so we're not like monitoring each and every prediction result. We're doing some sampling, but when this sampling catches something that is really below, it initiates, it gives a signal to the analyzer process in that system to do the retraining. So uh, let's do this, uh, let's run this uh, example. And uh, uh, so, to prevent any surprise, uh, before before I really go into um, the monitoring process, I will be explaining everything using my tables here. It will be a short initial period when I'll be forced to use those tables because my dashboards will start working only when I start the monitoring process. But that will be short and probably also informative. So what I'm doing, I'm starting first the generator process to start generating the input data for the system. Sending it a simple message. And I'm not, I don't need to follow it anymore because this is a perpetual process that will be working now permanently. I have a queue monitor here in the system in Iris platform that just tells me that the generator is working fine. So to check it, I go into my working directory, to my file system, and I see that it, out of three big uh, sources of uh, actually source input data. It has taken three chunks of standard size and uh, generated three three input batches that are waiting for being bufferized in, in, into the into my agentized system. I'm speaking of it as an agentized system because each uh, process in that system there are four is, is an absolutely uh, sovereign agent working uh, according to its own objectives and its own, its own criteria. So what I need to do next, I'll uh, start the buffering. Oops, start it. Go to my queue monitor, so I see that there are now two processes, the data generator and data buffer that are running. Basically to and now it, uh, on the start, it has deleted everything from the previous run, so all the buffers have been nullified. And then uh, and behind the scenes, it's now refilling the, the uh, labeled data. Why? Because I'm going here to my, to my analyzer process, opening it up a little bit, because there is no initial model. And before it's, it will start doing anything, any predictions, any, any scoring work, it will need to train the initial model on the minimum available volume of data. So for that it will need 
buffers refilled. So now I'm checking back. I see that my uh, buffer of unclassified uh, records is uh, being progressively filled out. In every batch, there's 100 record. The uh, label data, positive uh, tweets and negative tweets uh, have been already filled. All right, so uh, it has filled uh, 10, it had filled my uh, unclassified tweets buffer. And so we have previewed 10 batches for this buffer's depth. So now what I, what I can do, I can now proceed with starting to do the first model training. And I'm selecting the analyzer process. Click on test as with the previous two ones and invoke the testing service and leave it working. So now I'll just have a quick check that my three processes have started. You've seen that it, it, it in front of the analyzer process, there was quick one shown and then it was replaced by zero. Why? Because, because now uh, analyzer process is starting to interact with Python and you see that Python operation has been is now active, so it's doing actually the training work and uh, creating for us all the nice layers of that of that uh, sentiment analysis pies that uh, involves uh, vectorization, that involves uh, the neural net training. So let it do that work quickly. It works. The first training is usually quite quite quick. Let's see some, some accuracy metrics is the outcome. And I'm waiting for, and I'm waiting actually for it to give me the first area under curve. So this is the area under curve for the training, for the first training on the 10 batches, only 10 batches of labeled data. Not so bad, but also not so good. And with that, it starts doing the prediction work. So all the prediction outputs are being, we don't, we don't actually need to put that on the file system, but I'm, I'm doing it for better, better visualization. So I see it some results here, but I can also, I can also track those results in, uh, in, in the tables of the solution. So, so I see that seven patches have been, from the unclassified records have been scored. On the left, you see the results of the training, accuracy under curve and on the right, it progressively doing the prediction work on the first 10 batches of unclassified, previously unclassified data. So now I'm at the point when um, the, my system of processes has done run the prediction for the full buffer of the unclassified uh, records. So the buffer has been refilled. You see that the number of the batches has shifted by 10 and to have it work further, so what I need to do, I need to start the monitoring process. So this process has not been yet enabled. And once I start it, it will start removing the data from the monitoring queue. So the monitoring queue, I'm refreshing it, you see that the previous, what was previously in the, in the buffer is now moved to the monitoring queue. There are 10 previously buffered batches which are now in the monitoring queue and they have been completely monitored. I see it from the from the table here. So the uh, AUC, the area under curve had been cal calculated for each of those, each of those batches. And um, also uh, when uh, the uh, monitor will be receiving the new records from the buffer and it will see that the accuracy is not enough, it may start and it will start, I know it <laughs> from the experience, it will start uh, another training, but this time, the second time it will it will import another 10 new batches of labeled data to, to make its accuracy progress. So let's, let's invoke that. So I'm going to, to my production, click on tests, and I'm starting the monitoring process. So I'm checking here. Now I have my four processes actually collaborating. The full system is now in, in plan in full, um, uh, going full vapor. So what's happening now, uh, I can better take a look at, uh, at my dashboard. So basically uh, I see, I see my buffer. I see, see them, see the buffer of the unclassified records, unclassified tweets being refreshed. I see the outcome, those 76 something area under curve, the, the results of the first training uh, shown as the horizontal line, because there was only one training and in parallel, 
there's prediction that is being done. And uh, to make things uh, a little bit more difficult for, for the system, we, we programmed it, this, uh, we've parametered it in such a way that, um, that uh, no immediate retrain will be made. It will have to, after each training, it will have to renew, fully re renew the buffer. So it is now re rebuilding the buffer, but now it has touched at the 20th batch. It has seen that uh, the accuracy is really at this batch that it starts controlling, get back to controlling the accuracy. It's below the 80%. The area on the curve as the result, as the outcome of the prediction is now below 80%. So what's going now? Now it's, and you see that retrain file marker here in the working directory, it starts repeating the training. And it's repeating the training, as I said previously, by adding more batches in its training data set. So previously we've seen only 10 here, it has added another 20. So basically the purpose of it is to see in the end that we are achieving a better outcome because of actually extending our training data set. So let's take a look here. It'll take us, it'll take us some moments to, to complete the training and we will just witness that the accuracy has gone up. And that will be probably enough for us to, to, to understand the principle of what we are achieving in, the, in this example. I'm just waiting for it to finish, so it's finished. See this, see this little slope? So that means that after the, our second training, the accuracy obtained on the training results evaluation is now above 80%, which is promising. And we also see that the Prediction accuracy for some lapse of time is going up. Going up, good. Going slightly down. <laughs> While it's working, we can, we can also we can also observe the the classification results. So we as it works, as it, as it classifies our previously unclassified records. So each, each of the tweets is receiving sort of score, the probability of it being positive or negative. And um, in the uh, result monitoring dashboard, we, we actually see the two, two disjunctive sets of uh, tweets that have been classified. In the first case, uh, positive and the numbers are green and um, in the other case, negative, then the probabilities are shown red. And those are in permanent update because our results buffer is also updated and it's uh, the, the old, old uh, records are being removed, the new records are being fed. So by this, we are achieving a actually live uh, monitoring of, um, of the content that we, are, that we are loading into that agent-based system. So basically we've built a totally automated mechanism to, to control and auto control its uh, training accuracy and uh, to basically to, to acquire unclassified records that uh, need classification, something that probably would represent a newer press, a newer posts on the internet and make the whole uh, moving set of moving parts work together as as a system, as an adaptive system based on the buffers. So that means that we, we are protected against some temporary loss of data. We are uh, securing by using buffering, we're securing the permanent running. Checking and switching buffering and buffering as well. So each batch is containing 100 records. There could be cases when there are less than 100 records when uh, the system doesn't, is, is unable to import some, some particular tweets due to inability to interpret them, some spatial characters and so on, but so far so good. Uh, we have a question about retraining, actually. Yeah, let's, go, let's go to questions. Uh, Edward, sorry to, to interrupt. Please, please repeat the question. I'm just... I was uh, able to yes, to the question to... is, uh, so when it saw that uh, on batch with size 20, system decided to retrain. Right. When it, when, when it has seen it? When it saw that uh, on batch with size 20, 
uh, the system decided to retrain. Mm -hmm. I think it was more about the number of, uh, no, 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 can you go back to your previous? I think mm -hmm. it was about the, the generation. You have uh, like batch, batch 20 on, on, uh, on the lower dashboard. Yeah, you're right. The logic, uh, the logic is like that. It it it, it does some uh, training. Number one, in the very beginning, when you just start the whole uh, solution, it trains a model because it need, it needs something trained to work, and it does it. And it with that initial initially trained model, it predicts the does the prediction for first ten batches in the buffer, regardless of their outcome, regardless of their inferior actually accuracy. Then uh, what we configured that instead of immediately switching to to a retraining, it has to refer, fully re, rebuild the buffer. So it uh, adds another ten another ten batches in the process before it is allowed to retrain. We've done it in order to to make this um, system not overreact actually on on some temporary maybe losses of accuracy which could happen. But after it, it has uh, acquired the 20th batch from the buffer, and it's seen that it's not, what was it, 70 something, it, and it has seen that it's not uh, it's less than 80% the area under curve on prediction from that batch, the every training has been triggered. So that's just everything, what is what you see here till batch 20 is according to the rules implemented for that system of processes. Further on, uh, you see that um, without training, after, after the second training, the system has been running for 21 batch, which is also a small but progress. The higher the uh, quality, the accuracy on the training will be achieved, so we're now, we have survived the third <laughs> training here and we see it on the graph, the longer theoretically it's not guaranteed because everything is stochastic here and we cannot guarantee. But uh, asymptotically, <laughs> the more we repeat, the more we run, the, the more we see the distance between those trainings. That means that the quality increase, the accuracy increase we achieve on training will be converted into longer periods of um, uninterrupted prediction running. So that's, that's logic, just to, 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 to give you a global view of it. Uh, any any more questions on the stack? I do have another question. Uh, once the uh, RNN model is trained, uh, would you save it to H5 format so it can be deployed? Uh, PMML uh, doesn't support this exact type of a model. Uh, I would like mm -hmm. to add a comment, I, I guess, that uh, in uh, Python Gateway we um, we offer a generalized object serializer, deserializer, so you can easily um, download your current state of your Python process into Iris on disk. Uh, well, into Iris, not on, not as a file. I mean, uh, do and do parallelization this way, so you can both save and restore uh, Python codecs from Iris. The advantage. Uh, of this approach is that you can do it to any object, uh, not knowing the difference or what's inside. But we do support specific file formats. Sergey, mm -hmm. yes, uh, and it's a good remark uh, from Edward. Actually, actually, all we see on those working directories normally it should not be it shouldn't be polluting the file system. Like my, here it's happening here. I'm showing now, if you see my screen, I'm showing you um, working directly from our Russian language, a prototype of actually doing practically the same thing, but with a Russian corpora of uh, texts. And um, that prototype was implemented uh, using uh, TensorFlow and, um, and some other libraries to do the vectorization that precedes a uh, neural net training and there we were able to, to actually save, freeze out our embeddings in that format. And uh, when uh, the neural net was actually starting to preparing to be trained, then uh, the process was reading from those files, the results of uh, the embeddings 
that is just a, qu a question of implementation. In our current, in our current uh, demo that we're showing, we're not using it. We have, um, we have a um, data set, uh, according to the authors actually of this scenario, it wasn't us, like, like I said in the beginning, they were gracious enough to, to do for us all those embeddings as one single file with a txt extension, but uh, essentially it's the same as those h5. So it's read once at, at the start of the, of the system, at the start, start of the analyzer process. And then it's, it's being used continually all through, all through the working of this system of processes. Uh, as far as my information goes, they have uh, embedded some uh, huge chunk of Wikipedia text in here. So this, this is supposed to be, <laughs> to be enough to, to cope with the vectorization of uh, English language tweets for the purposes of this demo. So this, this guy is doing all right. 40, yeah, it's, you see it's growing 41, now it's 63. So it's been running uh, without training for 22 batches already immediately initially it was 19 then 20 then 22 so it's it's going well uh any uh please uh, any any other questions we don't have we, any more questions so far. we would like we would like to remind that well maybe some of some of our audience are maybe trying to formulate a question uh, Edward, let me remind you that your wonderful material is is available publicly, and I'm showing it uh, on on the screen right now. So we, you can, those that are interested and that uh, would like to check it, you can you can download its Docker implementation. You can uh, install the samples used in in the, in the demo showed by shown by Edward and some other demos uh, on your host. You see the links. You can uh, play actually with a pre-configured demo of Edwards using the link you see on the screen under the third bullet. So it's a it's a configured like it's, it's a configured like a learning services our learning services official sites course. So you can enroll for that course and actually enjoy a guided experience if you would really like for us to get some hands-on experience on the tooling itself. Um, in addition, uh, just to repeat the, the very first uh, slide you we've shown in, in the session today, we would like to attract your attention to, to our open exchange marketplace with uh, specific pages in it uh, dedicated to Python Gateway and R Gateway, the two uh, solutions that we uh, call a machine learning toolkit altogether. We would really like to encourage those of you that are not yet part of our um, machine learning toolkit user group to write us to the address you see on your screens, uh, ML toolkit at intersystem.com, your GitHub account details, uh, actually the name of your GitHub account, and we would add you to, to that community. There are a number of um, useful materials that you can uh, get from there. And again, Python gateway samples, uh, the link is also quoted here. You'll be sent uh, all those slides actually at after after our session today, as a single presentation, any any questions so far, uh, Edward? I think there is currently. We, we are questions. offering. I think we, we're, we're. We we're have only for. one minute left, mm -hmm. so it's your last chance to to ask <laughs> questions right now. If anyone is interested, and if not, uh, again, uh, robotize with us implement distributed calculations. You've seen it from Anton's demo that it's not just Iris that is supposed to do all the robotization work. We can share the workload with the public leverage available. Uh, yes, please. Uh, have you guys done time series? Uh, the answer is yes, of course. We, 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 don't, we didn't put it on, the, on this demo because we kind of, um, concentrate of on the robotization today, whatever the ML content is. We, we could have done it actually with the time series example. But to, to give you a, a, a better view of it, if, um, if you Google through our learning services pages and you look for co-innovation in banking presentation delivered at our global summit 
2019 in Boston. This year, this September, you'll find a uh, recorded session from there, slides plus voices. And uh, among the examples presented in the banking context, there is also, we, we, we have given some details on the time series, uh, time series uh, mechanism we've implemented for them that uh, predicts uh, the volume of transactional activity of uh, payment processing partners of the bank. So please, uh, uh, if you don't find, you, you, can, you can contact us uh, at the, the following email, email to toolkit at intersystems.com and we'll be happy to send you individually the, the link uh, to that recording. Returning, but returning, <laughs> Uh, uh, but returning to, to the thought I'm starting to develop that um, about, about the robotization. So we've, the, the purpose of the objective for today was to, to show that we can distribute the robotization, ML AI robotization work between uh, the Iris platform and uh, the available cloud services with Iris in, in the driver's seat and actually orchestrating the process. Eduard has shown that we are able to, to orchestrate and to make work in a single analytical process. The mathematical modeling environments like Python in this case, it would be also R, and uh, we can take control of uh, when and how would like those mathematical modeling be involved. And uh, my demo uh, was um, trying to show that we can also cope with the huge volume of data, the unpredictability of the external environment by uh, actually configuring our robotized ML as an agentized system with uh, multiple processes, each of them playing its role and actually guaranteeing a stability and uh, uh, I would say uh, the robustness of um, our consumption of um, machine learning content, but whatever it is, time series, neural nets, sentiment analysis can, can be anything, All right? Uh, if we know, if uh, unless we have any additional questions, Edward? Uh, no, no, no questions so far. We're good. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, we will send you a recording and a presentation of this webinar. And I think our time is up for today. Thank you. You're, please stay with us. Enroll in other in our future webinars. You are our golden audience. We value a lot your time and your attention to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.